Routman. And over time, after she graduated from San Francisco State, went back and worked in Eric's lab, um, looking and studying reptiles. And I got to go on one of these trips that she's going to talk about. And I was just so excited for Sarah because I know for everybody here at MJC that had a student, uh, Sarah as a student, we all got to know her really well and was like, oh, look, she's a bright and shining star. She's going to do great things. I picked up that Eric knew that right away. And that's really great. And so she... Um, She's close to my heart. I'm glad to call her a colleague and now a professor of biology. Um, she's one of our adjunct professors and she also is our tech for anatomy and physiology. And um, so this is talk today is based on her research work that she did for her master's degree. And so it's with great privilege to introduce Sarah Davis. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I wanted to mention all of you guys that are over there, there's a few seats over here and there are some little chairs if you want to sneak around and yeah, raise your hand if you have a seat next to you. If you want to have a seat. I'll wait a minute to let people kind of filter in. I will try to project. I'm not uh, quite as loud as Aaron Thompson, but I'll do my best. Um, let me make sure my clicker works. Okay. Uh, so I'm Sarah. Uh, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my graduate research and some cool reptiles that I got to work on and that uh, you could see out in the Mojave Desert if you wanted to go out there. Um, I'm gonna talk about Zyzix. How many of you have heard of Zyzix or have seen this road sign like if you were driving to Las Vegas? Only a few, okay. And the people I kind of thought would know. Uh, I'm going to tell you what is out there, some history of that. Um, social media likes to call it a ghost town. It's not a ghost town, but I'll get to that. Um, so 10 years ago, this is me, 10 years ago, I took a herpetology class in my undergrad at San Francisco State with Eric Routman, Dr. Eric Routman. Uh, that class was a lot of fun. It was my first real foray into like the reptile world. I always thought that snakes and lizards were pretty cool. Uh, and then I got to study them. And then we took a field trip to the desert, uh, to Zyzix. And, um, I'm going to give you a little background on Zyzix. So in 1944, a man named Curtis Springer uh, filed mining claims on 12,000 acres in the Mojave Desert. Uh, he filed mining claims, but didn't do any mining. Instead, he built a health resort spa. He was a radio evangelist. Um, he would split his time between the desert and Los Angeles, and he actually, like, bust in people from Skid Row to help him build this resort out in the middle of nowhere. And he named it Zyzix because he wanted to have the last word in health and the last word in the English language. Um, so he built this, this large resort. It had a two-story hotel, classrooms, a laboratory. It had a pool house. It had a pool that was in the shape of a cross um, that people could come and bathe in the natural spring because this area that he built in had a lot of natural spring water. Uh, so he also lied to people and told them that it was hot springs and had like fake heaters that would heat up the water in the pool. Um, so he, also, he was a self-proclaimed doctor, meaning he was not a doctor. 
Uh, he created like miracle elixirs that he sold to people uh, to cure everything from cancer to baldness. And uh, eventually he managed this resort for 30 years before people really started complaining. And once people started complaining, the government got involved because he was on public land. So the Bureau of Land Management looked into his mining claims, realized that he was not mining, he was running a religious spa, and they shut him down. They uh, sued him, or they fined him, uh, jailed him, I think, for 60 days, and then removed him from the property and took it from him. So that was in 1974. So they took it from him. So what's there now? It's not a ghost town. It is now called the Desert Study Center. So this is a picture. This is the whole property. I mean, it extends all the way down here, but this is a lake that he built. This is where the two-story hotel is. This is the pool house back here. Um, classrooms, laboratories are here, commercial kitchen. Um, so in 1976, the Bureau of Land Management signed an agreement with the CSU system to uh, have them operate a field station out of the old resort. Uh, I believe it's CSU Fullerton that manages it now. Um, and then in 1994, uh, the Mojave National Preserve was created and um, Zizix was kind of transferred from BLM to the National Park System. And so, let me go back, I'll just point out, this is the pool right here. And you can kind of see it used to be in a cross shape, but when the CSU system took it over, they filled in this part of it and just made that part of it swimmable. Um, it, uh, I believe it no longer functions because it's got too many cracks. It's hard to tell, but this is actually sinking. This wall is sinking down into the soda lake that is behind it because of all the natural spring water in the ground. Uh, this is one of the research trailers where grad students can stay long term and do their work like I did. This is a swing set that was in front of the lake. Uh, that is no longer there, unfortunately, because they were worried about a liability during COVID. People were coming on the property and getting on the swings and they just don't want to get sued if someone gets hurt. Um, so I've already said some of this. Uh, classroom, they have a classroom and a laboratory for um, classes to go out there. So you can take uh, a field trip out there with your class like we did in my herpetology class. Um, I believe CSU Fullerton probably uses it the most since they manage it, but any CSU or community college can use uh, the facilities for like field studies. Um, two research trailers for long-term stays. They have air conditioning, which is great, and a full kitchen. Uh, the lake that I mentioned, Lake tu Tuindy, might be the best thing that Curtis Springer did out there. Um, he built this man-made lake and he pulled these little fish from the springs that were around the area. So this fish is critically endangered. It is called the Mojave Tui Chub. And he basically saved their population by moving them from these springs that would eventually dry up and putting them in this giant man-made lake. So now this lake is federally protected and cannot be messed with. The fish cannot be removed. And they actually study uh, these populations of fish to check on their populations to make sure that they are expanding and not dying off. Uh, and then one other thing that's my favorite 
is the Mad Greek. I don't know how many of you have driven to Las Vegas on the 15. If you've driven through Baker, Baker is about 10 minutes away from Zizek's. This is always the first stop after we get to the research station. That is our dinner on night one. I highly recommend it. It's the best gyro I have had, shockingly, out in the middle of the desert, the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so a little bit about the Mojave Desert, a little background. This is the Mojave. It's one of four major deserts in North America. Uh, the Mojave, the Great Basin, the Sonoran, and the Chihuahuan. So Great Basin would be like right here. It's kind of northeast. Sonoran is here. And the Chihuahuan is like here. So the Mojave is the smallest and the driest of the four deserts. Uh, it gets two to six inches of rainfall a year. Uh, it can get more. It can get less. It snows at the higher elevations, which is really cool. I have been snowed on in the desert. Um, during the summer, the temperatures average from 90 degrees to 105, but there can be 120 degree days out there. Uh, summers can be brutal. Uh, that's why we do our research in the spring, if we can help it, usually April, May, and sometimes June if the weather permits. Um, the Mojave is considered high desert because most of it is within uh, 2,000 to 4,000 feet in elevation. And it was named after the indigenous peoples that lived there. They were called Hamakave. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, meaning beside the water because the Mojave River used to flow through there and its terminus was in the Soda Lake uh, that is behind uh, the Desert Study Center. So here is a map. This is the Mojave National Preserve that is within the Mojave Desert. Here is the I-15 running north along the park. And then this is the I-40 down below. Um, here is Zizek's right here. So here's the road and then the research station is here. So I'm just gonna go over some geographical features of the preserve just to give you an idea of where we were working. Um, I'll point them out here first. So like here are the cinder cones and lava beds, extinct volcanoes. There's some sand dunes here. Uh, those were the two, so here, and Zizek's were the two main places I collected from, uh, but we did do some collecting at the dunes. And then the Joshua tree forest that is out there is right here at Sema Dome. So some topography of the preserve and the Mojave Desert in general has a basin and range topography. So it's got these mountain ranges that run parallel to each other and they have these basins in between or these little valleys. And this is a picture of what that would look like. Um, this is very popular in Nevada. I think most of Nevada is part of the Great Basin Desert. So it is, really has this topography out there. Um, this is the Joshua Tree Forest that is in the preserve. Um, <laughs> These Joshua trees are, they're not endangered technically. They're not on the endangered species list, but they are threatened because their range has been reduced a lot. Uh, over the last 13,000 years since the Shasta ground sloth went extinct. So that sloth would eat the fruits from these trees and then it would travel long distances and poop out the seeds. And that was how their range was so wide. So when that animal went extinct, their range really shrunk. Um, climate change is also a big issue. Uh, wildfires, so you can see here, this is the same area as this. Uh, this dome fire happened in 2020. And it was uh, from a thunderstorm. Luckily, it wasn't like human caused, 
But because there were so many invasive grasses and plants, the whole area just lit up. And 1.3 million Joshua trees were killed in that fire. So that's really bad. Um, and it's a really beautiful area. I highly recommend going out there to see it. It actually is the densest Joshua tree forest in the world, even more than Joshua Tree National Park, which is kind of funny. So I mentioned the sand dunes. This is Kelso Dunes. Um, this is an area where we collected. You can see there is a nice little snake up here. This is the lava flow. That's me standing on top of one of the lava flows. So here are these cinder cones. And then you can see the lava coming off. And then I was standing like right here. And there's a road that runs along here. And then sandy flatlands and washes. That's pretty self-explanatory. And then a wash is where flash floods happen. So here is an example. There's that lava flow I was standing on. Here's the road. These roads are built over washes through the desert. So when it rains really heavily, um, the flash floods come through. And this is why you're never supposed to drive through a flash flood because this is the kind of destruction it can cause. It can kill people. Um, luckily, they have repaired this. This happened in multiple areas of the park, uh, but they were actually very fast at fixing it, which I appreciate because I used this road for my research. So I know you hear a lot of people say, oh, the desert, that's a barren wasteland. There's nothing out there. There's nothing living. That is wrong. Uh, you've already seen some of the plant life in the pictures. There's lots of plants and animals. It is a very biologically rich environment. And um, I'm gonna go over some of the animals. I know my talk is called Miles of Reptiles, but I'm gonna briefly discuss some of the other animals that live there. So here, I guess my videos are gonna autoplay. Uh, this is a desert wood rat and her babies hiding in a rock crevice. Um, we were looking for lizards uh, with a mirror and shining lights into rock crevices, and we found that. So sometimes you get surprised by what you might find. Uh, these are little round-tailed ground squirrel pups. They'd fallen out of their den and they were squeaking, and that's how we found them. So we just kind of like picked them up and put them back into their den. And then, I might have to click this one. Uh, my favorite mammal, and these are like my rodent mammals, is the kangaroo rat. So I don't know if any of you have seen Dune. You could think of the Muad'Dib as the little, the kangaroo rat. This is a kangaroo rat. I'm gonna pause this video. Uh, I was trying to pick it up Oh, don't do this to me. It's not gonna play, no. Okay, well, I'll try to get it to play later. Anyway, I tried to pick up this tiny little K-Rat and I went to pick it up and it jumped and hit me in the face. <laughs> I just thought it was funny and I would include it. Uh, now I'm gonna be upset if my other videos don't work. So let's hope that that is not the case. So another mammal, this is one of the large mammals that lives out in the desert is the bighorn sheep. They are a federally protected species. And it is actually really rare to see this many of them. Um, this was actually 10 years ago on that field trip that I took that we saw this huge group. They came down from the mountain to drink from the spring water that is down by the road. And so I was able to get some pictures. Now, this guy over here, uh, there's some people up here on the top of that mountain. They were watching a bobcat try to chase bighorn sheep. Uh, if you've ever seen a bobcat, they're not too much bigger than a house cat. So I don't know why, they must have been really hungry, but it scared this guy 
from out of the mountain and I just see him barreling toward me. And I'm like, I'm gonna be one of those people that dies filming animals running toward me. So that's why the video cuts because I stopped taking pictures uh, to try to find somewhere to hide but I was on the top of a hill and couldn't. So, but luckily he ran like next to me and not directly at me. Um, there's lots of birds uh, out there. There's uh, lots of permanent resident birds and then migratory birds. So like this great blue heron, we see them in the lake at the uh, research station all the time. You saw this little western tanager out there too. I know that's not a great photo, but it's a very pretty bird. It's what I had. And then invertebrates. There's lots of invertebrates out there, but I just wanted to share these two because I think they're cool. This is a desert hairy scorpion. And this is a desert hairy scorpion glowing under a UV light. So what we do is we go out at night, Liz knows, she was terrified. We go out with our headlamps. Yeah, we turn our headlamps off and we turn our black lights on and walk around in pitch black looking for scorpions, anything that glows. And it's a lot of fun. And also, if you're afraid of the dark, it's a little scary because I'm afraid of the dark, but it's okay. So um, this other invertebrate, this is a tarantula hawk. These guys are super pretty. They are dark bluish black with bright orange wings. Um, if you get stung by one of these, it is supposed to be the second most painful sting in the world. So I try to take pictures of them and then leave them alone. I did have one chase me down a wash. That was slightly terrifying. Uh, they are called tarantula hawks because they drag tarantulas into burrows and then lay eggs on them. And then the eggs hatch and they eat the tarantula while it's still alive. So that's their first meal. So that's pretty metal. <laughs> now to the reptiles, everyone's favorite, the desert tortoise. Uh, these guys are critically endangered due to habitat loss from habitat destruction, fragmentation. Um, they also um, are at risk from predation as eggs and hatchlings. Uh, ravens love to eat baby desert tortoises, which is so sad. And there are so many ravens out there because people just leave their trash everywhere and they like to go through the trash and then they find the desert tortoises and eat them. So um, I would like to point out, these are zoomed in photos. I was not that close. I have to stay about 20 feet away from them if you see them out in nature. Also, if you see one on the road, you don't want to pick it up if you can help it because if you pick them up, they can void their bladder and that is where they store most of their water. So what you would do is you pick them up very close to the road and gently carry them off the road so that they don't get hit by cars because that is another um, cause of death for a lot of desert tortoises. So snakes, lots of snakes out here in the desert. Uh, these are colubrid snakes. They are the largest group of non-venomous snakes. Um, I'm going to go over a couple of them. There are 19 species in the park. I didn't have room <laughs> or not time to go over 19 of them, so I put the ones that we see most often on here. Uh, this is a coach whip snake. It is eating a desert iguana. I don't think he was able to finish this meal because that is a very large <laughs> lizard. Um, this is a glossy snake. Most of these snakes we find at night when we do our night driving or road cruising. Uh, this is a spotted leaf nose snake. You can see its nose is kind of shaped like a shovel. That's because they like to burrow into the sand. And this little guy over here, the Western shovel nose snake, has a similar kind of shovely looking face. He also likes to burrow in the sand. 
Uh, we have a uh, desert night snake, a long nose snake, which looks very much like a king snake, but it is not. There are California king snakes out there. I have not seen one. Um, and then we have a gopher snake. So this is one that we have here. Uh, not this species. We have the Pacific gopher snake. Uh, actually, on this campus, we have some. So they like to hang out in the wooded areas. Uh, and so I thought that was kind of cool that this is one that you might even see slithering around on campus. Then we have our vipers. There are three species of vipers in the Mojave National Preserve, and these are pit vipers. So they have these little pits on the fronts of their faces. Those are heat sensing pits. Um, they use those for hunting warm blooded animals. This is a sidewinder. They are the smallest of the rattlesnakes that we find out there and the most numerous. Um, this is a Mojave rattlesnake, also called a Mojave green. Um, they are, they can get quite large. Uh, they also have, so all of these have hemotoxin. This one also has neurotoxin. So a bite from this snake is very dangerous uh, because the hemotoxin damages tissues. Uh, neurotoxin affects your central nervous system. So think no breathing. Like, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not good. And then this is a speckled rattlesnake. This is probably the least populous one. Like, I think I've only seen three of them and one of them was dead on the road. Um, but I think the rattlesnakes, they're probably my favorite reptile out there. They're just super cool. And I would like to point out that rattlesnakes are not aggressive. They will not chase you. They are defensive. So if you scare them, they're going to let you know that they're there by rattling. Just a warning. They will not chase you to bite you. They cannot eat you, you are too big. So they don't want to waste their venom on you or risk getting hurt. I just think that's an important distinction because a lot of people think, oh, rattlesnakes are aggressive. They're definitely not. And then lizards, tons of lizards. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna go through all of these because I think I might be running a little long. <laughs> so we have a gecko. It looks kind of like a leopard gecko, but much smaller and the skin is more translucent. This is a whip tail. They are very fast and hard to catch. Desert horned lizard, or some people might call those a horny toad. Uh, I like to call them a flapjack because they're like little pancakes. They're flat. Zebra tailed lizard, it has these beautiful, the males have these beautiful colorations on their bellies. Uh, Chuckwalla is one of the large bodied lizards. Also a long nosed leopard lizard. Uh, this is a female in her breeding colors with those orange spots. Uh, Mojave fringe toad lizard, these are only found in the sand dunes. And I believe they are a species of special concern in California. And a spiny lizard, this might look familiar. It is in the same family as Western fence lizards that we have here, that's Scoloporus. So a little bit about my research. I was looking at population size and genetic diversity in uh, lizard species. Uh, so my question, does population size affect genetic diversity in sympatric lizard species? So sympatric just means they are closely related lizards that evolved in the same geological area. So they should have very similar life histories uh, so like if there was a major drought, all of those species would have experienced the same drought. So they should have very similar mutation rates and genetic backgrounds. <clears throat> so my lizards, my study species, I have four of them. So the first is the iguanid family. I have a chuckwalla and a desert iguana. So the chuckwalla, 
is a smaller population lizard and they are a habitat specialist. They only live in rocky outcroppings and the desert iguana is a larger population species and they live in um, a more general habitat. So like the sandy flat lands and washes. So we would call them a habitat generalist. And then my other family that I looked at was crotophyted family. So I have a collared lizard. Again, they're the smaller population lizard and habitat specialist. And then the leopard lizards are a larger population and in um, sandy flatlands and washes. So my hypotheses for my research, I had two of them. One, the herbivores will have more genetic diversity than the carnivores. I should have mentioned the iguanids are herbivorous, the crotophytids are carnivorous. Uh, and then hypothesis number two, the habitat generalists will have more genetic diversity than the habitat specialists. So here's a nice picture of what that means. So these will be more diverse over here, and then these will be less diverse, if my hypotheses are correct. So when you're in grad school, you kind of have to go through these steps to complete your research. So I'm gonna briefly talk about them all, but really I'm gonna focus on sample collection because it's the most fun. So this is a map of where I collected my samples. So here is Isaacs. So here's Isaacs Road running along a mountain. And then over here is the lava field. And then you can see down here, they have color coded um, the lizards that I caught. Habitat types, so we have our rocky outcroppings. There's a little chuckwalla there. And then uh, habitat generalists would live here in the sandy flatlands and washes. There's a little hair right there. So sample collection, how do I collect my samples? Well, I go fishing. And I'm gonna do a little demo for you on how Oh, my pole's over here. How we catch lizards. This is a fishing pole. This is a lizard. Uh, the lizards would never be this still. Just so we have our very long fishing pole because a lot of the lizards are going to be too warm because they're out in the sun. So they're gonna be too fast to catch by hand. So we get a little help from these. So we open it and then we check. We have a little cotton string on the end that is in a slip knot noose. So we open it up. I'm gonna see if it stays open enough for me to do this. This is also a problem we have out in the desert that and the wind. So you want to be far away from your specimen so they don't see you and run away. And then you do this and they don't really see the string. They might just think it's like grass. And then you loop it around their neck and you lift and their weight closes the string. And they're never this still. They're always flopping around, and then you got to hurry, and then you gently grab them, and then you remove, gently remove this while trying not to get bitten, and usually failing, which I will go over. So that is how we catch them. Uh, sometimes we get lucky, and we can catch them by hand hand, but not usually. Uh, and that is about life size for that lizard. That would be a collared lizard. So as you can see, this one's still got the string around his neck. And then this is the um, folder where we keep our data. And we always take a picture of them on it for reference for GPS and just to have a picture of like their markings. 
So taking tissue <coughs> actually brought my sample collection box. So we take this box out with us and it has these vials in it and they have 95% ethanol in them. So I have some scissors and tweezers in here. So as you can see, this is my advisor, Eric. Uh, he was about to take a sample from a deceased uh, Phrynosoma. And you can see he's got the scissors. So we just cut the tip of the tail off, which doesn't hurt them. And their tails grow back, so it's fine. They're not missing it. So you can see right here, they're cutting the tail and then taking the picture. Mishaps. Sometimes these lizards don't like it when you catch them. I don't blame them. If someone came into my house and picked me up randomly, uh, I would probably be mad too and bite them. So, but as you can see, like these are all this, this is the same lizard. These are the same species. These are the carnivorous lizards. And this one's also the carnivorous lizard. This is the collared lizard. Uh, that one really hurt. <laughs> I was not happy. Usually I don't mind being bitten because it doesn't hurt that bad. That was not fun. Don't recommend, zero out of 10. Uh, let me see if I can stop this from playing. So we also take samples from snakes. Uh, for the rattlesnakes, there is a special way that we have to take samples. And I, as a student, was not allowed to manipulate the rattlesnakes because those were the school rules and we want to keep everyone safe. So I have some videos of my advisor just to show you how he would catch them in a safe way for us to take tissue samples. So that is a sidewinder. And he built this contraption with a two by four and a canvas strap with Velcro. <coughs> and you very gently close it. So you're not pulling it tight. You just wanna have it tight enough that they can't back out of it because they have a triangle, triangle shaped head so see, he's trying to move it back so that it's not going to move forward or back out of the strap. And then he pushes the Velcro down. And then usually he has a foot on the end so that if the snake is larger and it starts like thrashing, the pole doesn't like move. Um, but see, you can safely touch them once they are in the contraption. And see, he's checking the temperature of the dirt with his hand to make sure that it's not too hot for us to have that snake right there. And so this is a video of how we take samples from a rattlesnake, which is not. OK, there we go. Um, can't hear the sound. That's OK. So you can see. He's just trimming the belly scales off of the snake. So it doesn't hurt them. Um, you just trim a little bit, an edge, almost like a fingernail. Uh, so you wouldn't want to go down to like the skin, like the quick, because that would hurt them. So you take a couple of clippings and then we put them in the vials, on the in the alcohol, and then once we have a few samples, because we want to be able to get DNA, we let them go. And they're on their merry way. So I won't play too much of this video. It's just it going into the, the burrow in the bush. And we say goodbye. There are mishaps with snakes also. Not rattlesnakes. Uh, no one's ever been bitten by a rattlesnake. Um, I have been bitten multiple times oh, by this guy. This is a coach whip. Showed him earlier. They are very fast and feisty. If you pick one of these up, it is almost a 100% guarantee that they will bite you. 
it doesn't hurt. Um, it just feels like a little pinch. Uh, except this one kind of chewed on me. You can see this in the shape of its mouth. Um, but I promise it didn't it didn't hurt that bad. Uh, this is a liar snake. I also was bitten by one of these, and they are mildly venomous, but they are rear fanged. So it kind of wrapped its mouth around my finger and just kind of bit a little bit. And then my finger was tingly and got numb. I thought I was going to die. Eric was like, you're fine. That thing can't hurt you. I survived. <laughs> so earlier I mentioned road cruising. That is another way that we find, this is how we find most of our snakes actually. Um, is we go out as the sun is setting. Hopefully it's been a really hot day. Uh, the hotter, the better, because we want a good temperature on the road. You want the road to be around 90 degrees. I don't know why it flipped this picture weird. I'm just going to ignore that. Um, you want the sand to be in the 60s, maybe 70 degrees, and the road to be 80s to 90s because then the snakes will come off of the sand to warm up on the heat of the asphalt. And we drive very slowly down the road with our high beams on and look, we go, oh, snake, stop. Oh, no, that's a stick. Oh, wait, that's a snake. Nope, that's another stick. Happens all the time. So uh, I, somehow have really good eyes for spotting these tiny little snakes on the road, like this shovel nose snake. I know there's no size comparison, but that was the one I was holding in the very first picture from 10 years ago. So they are tiny. Um, but I always get to ride shotgun because I have good uh, road cruising eyes, as Eric likes to say. <laughs> so COVID-19. What happens if you're in grad school and you are doing research and you need to collect samples and there's a global pandemic and everything is shut down? You camp out in the desert. <laughs> so the research station was shut. So my advisor was like, let's go camp and collect samples. So we did. We just wore masks when we were close to each other because it was pretty early on. We didn't know much about COVID at the time. Uh, there's a picture of me laying in the road holding a sidewinder because why not? There's no cars. Nobody's out there except us. Take, take some photos with my slithery little friends. So that is our sampling methods. Sorry, my throat is dry. Uh, so next, this part is less fun, but I still think it's fun. Uh, we had to go back to the lab with our samples <coughs> and do DNA extraction and quantification. So here's me doing some DNA extraction. I did many, many DNA extractions. Most of them did not have anything on them. And then finally, I had my eight samples that I wanted to send off, and I did my gel electrophoresis and got DNA. So I know they have DNA. What do I do next? I have to quantify how much DNA is in each sample uh, for the company that we sent these off to. So I used a qubit <clears throat> and a nanodrop to quantify the specific amounts of DNA in each sample. Next is next generation sequencing. So that's great because I don't have to do it. I just send my samples off to a company, tell them I want whole genomes for these animals, and they send it back. Um, so uh, we did de novo whole genome sequencing, which just means there was no genome that I could compare my genomes to in like the BLAST database. Uh, so I had novel genomes for these animals. And then the last part, data analysis. 
by far the least fun, especially since I did a bunch of bioinformatics, which is not my forte. Uh, I'm not going to go in depth on this, but I just wanted to point out these are some of the programs that I had to use uh, when I got my files back. So, you know, I had to trim files, create files, convert files. Like, it was a lot. And these files were really big files, like gigabytes. Like, I had to buy an eight terabyte hard drive to hold my genome files. Um, so, I don't, some people, if you're computer people, if you like coding, you might love this. Aaron Thompson, this is right up his alley. <laughs> this was not right up my alley, but I got it done. So then, results. So let's revisit my hypotheses. So well, I said the herbivores will have more genetic diversity than the carnivores, and the habitat generalists will have more genetic diversity than the habitat specialists. So let's see. Drum roll, please. Ah, so my first hypothesis not supported by my data. My second hypothesis was, however, supported. So let's see what that looks like. Back here, we'll revisit. This is what it should have looked like. That's what I got. So as you can see, the carnivores came out as having more genetic diversity than the herbivores which was not what I had hypothesized. But the generalists in both of those um, trophic levels came out as being more diverse, which that was my second hypothesis. So that one was supported. So here's just both of those together for a little bit better of a visual. Um, there are many reasons why this could have happened, um, none of which I'm going to go into because it's very in-depth. But sometimes in science, that's just what happens. Your hypotheses are not supported, and that's okay because science is always evolving. So now you go back to the drawing board and you try to find out why. And I hope that my talk has kind of inspired anyone in here who is interested in a subject or maybe like you think reptiles are cool, maybe you could go to grad school and do research on these animals and maybe even stay at the Desert Study Center in Zizix because I think it's a great place and uh, I just, I love it. I call it my home away from home. So thank you guys for coming and listening to me ramble. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Or if you, oh, Aaron has a question. 